Hello, and welcome to Tech Talks by United Industries on the materials, manufacture, and use of high-quality stainless steel tubing for hygienic applications. I'm Carl Ketterman, metallurgist for United Industries. Our company has been an innovative domestic manufacturer of laser-welded stainless steel tubing for the food, dairy, and pharmaceutical industries for more than 50 years. I will be drawing on my 30 years of experience in this industry to bring you bits of te technical and hopefully helpful information. In this short video, we would like to present information about delta ferrite in stainless steels used in the manufacture of hygienic product processing equipment, particularly for the pharmaceutical and chemical process industries. We will discuss what delta ferrite is, how it is measured, and why it is of concern. Stainless steels are iron-based alloys that have enhanced corrosion resistance properties in many environments. The primary element that provides this stainless property is chromium. A minimum of 11% by weight chromium must be present to allow the steel to form its protective passive surface layer. 11% chromium allows us to make the ferritic grades of stainless, the 400 series materials used extensively in automotive exhaust applications. If we want a material suitable for food processing or other hygienic applications, we need to add some nickel, generally 8% or more, to yield an austenitic stainless steel structure. Other elements like molybdenum, manganese, titanium, copper, and nitrogen are added in small quantities to provide additional enhancements to corrosion resistance. If we were to take a microscopic look at the crystalline structure of stainless steels, we would find that there are two different structures, both of which are in the general form of a cube. In one, which we call the body-centered cubic phase, we find that iron, chromium, and nickel atoms are located at each corner of the cube with one atom in the geometric center of the cube. Additional alloying elements are squeezed in between these five atoms. This is the structure of ferrite and the building block of ferritic stainless steels and steels including carbon steels. This form of iron is known by metallurgists as either the alpha or the delta form of ferrite, depending on the temperature. As the temperature changes either up or down, the form will also change depending on the rate of temperature change. In the second structure, we would similarly find iron, chromium, and nickel at the corners, but instead of one atom in the geometric center of the cube, we have an atom located in the center of each of the six faces of the cube. This is a face-centered cubic structure and is the form of austenite, the building block for the 300 series stainless steels used in hygienic applications. Either or both structures, ferrite and austenite, can exist in a given steel having an austenitic chemical composition at different temperatures. In the austenitic steels, the 300 series, a phase transformation occurs at temperature of about 1400 degrees C. Liquid stainless steel solidifies as ferrite, but changes to austenite as it cools below 1400 degrees C. It then maintains this structure down to cryogenic temperatures. Specific amounts of carbon, nickel, manganese, and nitrogen are added to the alloy to ensure the formation of austenite. Chromium, silicon, and molybdenum, however, tend to increase the tendency to form ferrite. So in real life, when we examine an autogenous weld, that is one made without the addition of filler metal, there is generally a small amount of ferrite that does not convert to austenite and is still present at room temperature. It is present as delta ferrite. It is trapped in the austenite matrix as the weld tends to solidify and cool very quickly, not allowing time for the transformation to be completed 100%. How much delta ferrite is present is a function of the relative contents of chromium, silicon, molybdenum, carbon, nickel, manganese, and nitrogen, as well as the rate of cooling. The steeper the slope of the cooling curve, the higher the delta ferrite content. Like most things in life, the presence of ferrite in a weldman has some good value and some not so good value. On the good side, ferrite will tend to absorb undesirable contaminants like sulfur that promote hot cracking during solidification. Some sulfur is good for ensuring full penetration, while too much can result in increased fluidity of the weld puddle during solidification, 
resulting in cracks as the mushy metal contracts with decreasing temperature. The Welding Research Council recommends that a chemical composition that will result in a calculated ferrite content of 3 to 5 percent be used to optimize the balance between penetration and hot cracking. On the negative side, delta ferrite is partially responsible for alloy segregation, meaning that there is not a homogeneous distribution of the elements that provide good corrosion resistance properties. Chromium, carbon, molybdenum, and to a lesser extent nickel are absorbed by delta ferrite and are not available to help form the passive layer that protects stainless steel from corrosive attack. This diminished corrosion resistance is particularly noticeable in service environments of low pH or acidic halide compounds, usually those are chlorides, and they may be found in such solutions as CIP or SIP solutions or in process chemistries or buffers used in the pharmaceutical and food processing industries. To help us predict what the as solidified delta ferrite content will be in a weld of given chemical composition, researchers have developed an attribute called a ferrite number. There are various different formulas that have been developed incorporating different elements depending on the particular steel composition, but most are in the same ballpark for results. They all use a ratio of two values that are calculated based on the elemental composition of the steel. One is the chromium equivalent and the other is the nickel equivalent. These numbers represent the cumulative effect of all of the elements that promote ferrite formation, or the chromium equivalent, and those that promote the formation of austenite, the nickel equivalent. The formula We must be careful in applying these ferrite numbers to real life situations though, because they are only applicable to the as solidified condition, as in the as cast or the as welded conditions, and they are only estimates. Remember that the actual level of delta ferrite formation is also dependent on the cooling rate. The ferrite number is not valid for products that have not been heat treated by solution annealing. Most ASTM and ASME product standards for welded stainless steel tube and pipe for critical or special service conditions require products to be solution anneal heat treated before being put into service. United Industries strictly adheres to these requirements. Solution annealing consists of heating products to a minimum critical temperature, holding at that temperature for a period of time known as the soak time, and then rapidly cooling to below a maximum critical temperature. For a 300 series austenitic stainless steel, the critical temperatures are typically 1900 degrees Fahrenheit on heating and about 800 degrees Fahrenheit or 425 degrees C on cooling. The soak time at temperature is a function of the material thickness and of the welding method. The welding method is a factor in determining the dendrite spacing of the weld bead and therefore the diffusion distances that atoms must travel to achieve a homogeneous structure. United Industries uses exclusively laser beam welding methods, meaning that our welds have some of the shortest diffusion distances in the industry. We also solution anneal heat treat all of our 300 series stainless steel tubes. The result is that measurable delta ferrite levels are nil. Here we have a comparison of some industry standard composition requirements for 360L type materials. Two of them are comparable European compositions. The DIN 1.4435 composition was developed with slightly higher molybdenum content to improve pitting corrosion resistance. The BN2 or Basel Norm 2 was developed by a Swiss chemical processing company for a very specific application that required no delta ferrite in the field construction welds that were not able to be solution anneal heat treated. The ferrite numbers calculated for BN2 are not directly equivalent to the WRC numbers that we looked at earlier or any of the other more commonly used formulas. 
so it is important that when reporting or specifying a ferrite number, the calculation method also be identified. We can see here that knowing the specified nominal composition is not very helpful in determining a material's predicted ferrite number. One must know the exact composition in order to apply a delta ferrite calculation. The boxes indicate the composition limits that are possible for two different specification limits, and we can see that the ferrite number can change dramatically based on the actual composition. If we plug in the actual compositions of several 316L heats used by United into the WRC formula, we can see that United's tubing tends to have a ferrite number right around 4, which is well within the WRC recommended range. How do we actually measure delta ferrite levels? There are two readily available methods that require special equipment and utilize the magnetic permeability of the material. As delta ferrite is magnetic, whereas austenite is not, if we can measure magnetic permeability, we can correlate that level to the amount of ferrite present. Both tests are non-destructive. One uses an instrument called a ferrite scope, and the other uses a Severn gauge. Both methods are portable and can be used in the field. The ferrite scope can be calibrated to show a discrete quantitative value as either percent ferrite or as magnetic permeability. The Severn gauge results are reported in units of mu representing magnetic permeability and are bracketed as being between some upper and lower limit not as a discrete value. There is also a corrosion test known as the weld decay test that dissolves any ferrite present at a faster rate than it does austenite. It is a destructive test and should only be performed by trained experienced personnel as it involves boiling hydrochloric acid. It results in a discrete value around which acceptance values can be set. It is only applicable to welded products and not to seamless products. For those working to ASME BPE standards requirements, it should be noted that as of the 2019 edition of the standard, factory welded 316 type tube and pipe must be able to pass the weld decay test and an intergranular corrosion test. This requirement does not apply to field fabrication welds. Why are both of these statements correct? The actual measured ferrite content of United's laser welded tube is 0% because we use laser welding and solution anneal air tubing. The predicted ferrite content based on actual calculated ferrite numbers is typically around 4%. That is approximate value that will be realized in welds that are not post-weld heat treated as in field fabrication welds. I hope that you found this presentation informative and useful. I invite you to come back and visit us again for another brief information session at Tech Talks with United Industries. Thanks for viewing.